I'm going to conclude this service on worship this week and next week in, yes, a two-part sermon. Because as I was writing it, there's just too much. And so we're going we're gonna to be in James chapter 4. Today we'll be in 1 to 6, and next week we'll be in 7 to 10. They go together. In fact, if you were to read, 7 to 10 is actually more well-known. You, you probably know verses 7 to 10. In fact, I want to read them very quickly uh, for you. But uh, James 4, verse 7 says, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw, draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Often this passage is observed, and that's where we start, verses 7 to 10, because they're very clear verses. I mean, there are 10 imperative statements in those, those four verses, and we love imperative statements for the most part. We love imperative statements because they're just short, direct command, do this. And when it comes to God and his, hurt, and his word, sometimes I know you feel this way as well. I just want God to tell me what to do, and I'll do it. If you just, God, directly tell me what to do, I'll do exactly that. I want to obey, and, 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 but sometimes I'm uncertain what that looks like, so just tell me what to do, and I'll do it. And that's why we love James 4, 7 to 10. He tells us what to do. Seven direct, or, or, I'm sorry, ten direct statements starting at verse 7. And so just look at these. Count them with me if you'd like. He starts with submit ourselves to God, resist the devil, draw near to God, cleanse your hands, purify your hearts, and then quick ones, lament, mourn, weep. Be serious, or he says, let your laughter be turned to mourning here. And then finally, humble yourself before God. In fact, that's kind of the concluding thought. And so these very clear, direct statements help us understand what God expects us to do if we are to come before him humbly. But the question that kind of lingers in our mind is, why is God even telling us this? The book of James is the first book ever written, the first epistle of the New Testament. It was written before AD 49, before the, the Jerusalem Council. So it's probably the first book written. It's a very direct book. It's written by James, the half-brother of Jesus, who is now, at this point, the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, which probably has at least 15,000 members in the church. The, the, the Jews are beginning to come under attack because of the Pharisees and the religious persecution and the persecution of Rome. They're about to be scattered, and they're just learning, many of them learning how to live out their faith. And so James, under Scripture, gives these very direct statements of what a Christian should do. What should be going on in their heart as they come before the Lord? But the question is why? And verses 1 to 6 give us the why to that. And so we're going to start in verse 1 and read there. Would you read along with me? Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desire for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do, not, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in you, in us, yearns jealously? But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Well, we see the destructive nature of pride. In fact, if you had to sum up verses 1 through 6, it would be pride. And then you get to verse 7 through 10, and it's humility. And so it's pride that's the problem here. And it's in a destructive force in the life of anyone, but especially in the life of a, a person who calls themselves a disciple or a believer, a follower of Christ. 
And so pride here, we see right away, is it brings contention. It's the source of contention. He even says very plainly, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? And so this, this word uh, lust or pleasure here is the word hedonon. It's what we get our word hedonism from, to please oneself. And so it's to place oneself above others. It's to place oneself, in this case, above God, to desire and lust for things that please ourself rather than please the Lord. And that source is pride, to gratify our own desires regardless of the consequence. And this involves, of course, base cravings, Right? We, think, we see the word war and we think of a battlefield far away where there's people fighting over land or fighting over power. But the word war here means the inner battle that's going on inside of you. The war that's in your soul. The war that's in your heart every day, every week to, to fulfill your pleasure or to fulfill God's pleasure. That's the war. These base cravings and sensual pleasures. The desire for vengeance. These simple... Uh, uh, acts of of personal gain over sacrifice the warfare to get your own pleasure the simple tactics that you use to fight and battle to get what you want and here it's condemned in fact contention comes from arrogance Elsewhere in scripture, we learn this as well. Proverbs 22, 10. I really enjoy this verse. I wish we would remember it uh, more often. Cast out the scorner or the scoffer and contention will leave. Yes, strife and reproach will cease. So remove the, the scoffer, the one who in arrogance and pride is desiring their own benefit and the contention goes away. It's just a simple proverb, and yet how often we forget it. How often we're the source of that, and we forget it. And yet contention comes from arrogance, this selfish ambition that drives us to strife. It's a part of life. In fact, it's a part of living in this world. However, if we're going to live like Christ, then the contentious living should have no part in how we act and how we behave, especially with other believers, but even with the world around us. And it probably wouldn't be hard for you to, to sit here and think of how Christians exhibit contentious behavior that poorly represents Christ. We've all seen it. We've probably been the source of it at times. And do you not cringe when you see a Christian being contentious, arrogant, prideful, and battling with those around them? Do you not cringe thinking what that does to the name of Christ? But how often do we cringe when it's we ourselves who are the source of that? And so he, he tells us this, this lust, this, these base passions come from our desire to please ourselves, which is pride. In fact, pride is the source of all lust, seeking something for personal benefit. The, the word lust, it's actually, there's three different words of, of lust that are used in this passage. It's mentioned, I think, four times. The lust here in verse Two is, is the, a yearning passion for. That's literally what it means. It, it's not, uh, we think of lust, we think of sensual lust. We always couple the word lust with sensual things. But it literally just means a yearning passion for blank. You fill in the blank. It's just a yearning passion for something. In this case, if we're putting it in a biblical context, it's a yearning passion for something above God. And so here he links it. He links it to these horrible sins, the, the worst sins that we would never want to commit, and yet he links them here directly to them. Verse 2, you lust and do not have. Look at this. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. So he links it here with murder and covetousness. Now, we don't have to go very far to know exactly what he's he's pointing at he's pointing to the old testament ten commandments the decalogue that tells us not to murder and not to covet our neighbor's wife and then you couple that with matthew chapter 5 when jesus talks about the ten commandments and he says if you hate someone in your heart it's as if you've murdered and if you lust after them with your eyes it's as if you've committed adultery 
And so Jesus gets to the, just the direct meaning of the law. We love to leave the law at only external practices. And Jesus points to where the, the seed is planted, to where the heart of the matter is. It's our heart. It's the hatred and the lust that we have within our heart that is directly in opposition to God's way. And where does that come from? It comes this, this yearning in our heart to please ourselves. And so the result is not seeking God. It's not trusting Him. It's a, it's a lust for control, a desire uh, to, to be the one who is calling the shots, who's making the decisions and, and not caring or not thinking or not involving anyone spiritual in that process, especially God. And so it's a desire to be in control. It's really doubting God, doubting God's best, doubting what God is doing. In fact, there's kind of three levels of lust that are listed here. There's this, uh, this aspect or idea of to desire and lust, but, but not have. So desire and a lust, but that's as far as the desire and the lust goes. There's not action upon it, and yet Scripture makes it clear, Jesus makes it clear, that desire and that lust is just as bad as if you did it. Now, we don't think that. We don't want to think that in our life. We think, you know what? Uh, by the way, it's very uh, Judaism even today. I learned this uh, about a month ago. I learned that Judaism today teaches it doesn't matter what's going on in your heart or mind as long as you don't act upon it, it's okay. And yet Jesus makes it abundantly clear to the Pharisees and to the religious leaders that when we hate someone in our heart, it's as if we've murdered them because that's what we desire. And if we lust after someone with our eyes, it's as if we've committed adultery because that's what we're desiring in that moment. And that's wicked. And so there's this aspect of desire and lust but never, never acting upon it. Then there's this desire and lust and sinfully obtaining that lust through devious and undermining efforts. And so we would say this is like somebody who acts upon their sin and they live a double life. They, they act upon their sin, but pretty much nobody knows about it. And then there's a third category. It's those who desire and lust and obtain their lust through uh, un, unashamed, open, and hostile conquest. In other words, they don't care what anyone thinks. They're just going to do what they want anyways. And go ahead and judge me all you want. I don't care. And so there's three categories. And we would look at that third category and say, oh, Whoa, that's rebellion at its core. Just to, to directly oppose God and not care about the consequences. And yet James is telling us none, none of these are worse than the other. They're all equally bad in the sight of God because all of them are you fulfilling the, the base passions of your heart, at least in your mind, in direct opposition to God because you think you know what's best. And so none of these lustful works are good. All of them are against God. And yet we have in our society this culture that says, listen, if, if, if my sin doesn't affect you, what's that matter to you? That's not, you, it's not, you, you shouldn't have an opinion on that. If, it does, if my sin doesn't affect you, then who are you to tell me I'm wrong? That's what our, our culture says. And a lot of Christians would probably agree with it. And yet, we see the destruction of pride here in this passage. In fact, Jesus will go on and he tells us the, the pride is the source of these wrong motives in verse 3. In verse 3, he says, You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Now again, James is writing to believers. He's not writing to unsaved people. He's not writing to people outside the church. He's writing to the people in the church of Jerusalem, these Jewish believers and non-Jewish believers who are beginning to suffer persecution. They're under, they're under trials and temptations, as James 1 tells us. Life is getting a little bit difficult. It's not easy and breezy for them in Jerusalem. It's difficult. And at the same time, they have these yearnings. They're struggling with their old way of life. And James is trying to encourage them to, to kill the pride that is in their life. This pride that, that breeds improper motives. So they ask. That's prayer. They're, 
They're literally praying to God, but they're not getting the answers that they want in their prayers. And the reason is, James says, because you're praying for the wrong thing. You don't agree with God. You want God to agree with you, and you refuse to agree with God. You lust and you pray, and then you don't get what you prayed for. So think about that. They're acting spiritually. He's telling the believers, you have like this capacity to pray. You have a praying people in the church, and yet they're praying for the wrong things. And we're all tempted to do this. I've, I've told you embarrassing stories in my life where I've prayed for the wrong things before. We've all done that. We've prayed thinking we know what is right, but in, in reality, we're praying for our own desires. Our very motive of prayer is off. And so I ask you, what are some things that you've prayed for in the past that were done out of pride rather than out of humility? We pray for relationships, especially when we're teenagers, because we think we've met the one or we want them to be the one. We pray for, for jobs. We pray for all kinds of things. And none of those, it's not bad. You should pray for those things. But the question is, why are you praying for those what are you praying for? And Jesus makes it clear when he tells us what to pray and he gives us the model prayer, pray that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, that your will, God, will be done in my life. And so pride is also a source of worldliness. In verse 4, now this is really strong language. Look at what what James is saying here under inspiration, he says in verse 4, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And this is how we should look at, at lustful desires in our life. It, it causes us to be adulterers and adulteresses. In other words, spiritually unfaithful believers if you are a disciple of christ if you have been saved by the blood of christ then your most important relationship in this life is to christ to god your creator your sustainer the one who's given you redemption the one who provides you with grace my relationship with god takes precedence even over my relationship with my wife because if my relationship with god is not right my relationship with my wife is not going to be right either. And yet there's many Christians, and that's why James is writing this, there's many Christians whose, whose uh, relationship with God is probably third, fourth, fifth, sixth place in their life. And that's why he says you're a bunch of adulterers. An adult, you're unfaithful in your relationship, your spiritual relationship with God. The picture here is, is of us cheating on the Savior by lusting and pursuing an intimate relationship with false pleasures. He's really clear about that. In, in the second half, after he, he... I mean, what a loving pastor, huh? <laughs> Adulteresses! Adulterers! Exclamation point! Oh, I guess that was added later. Do you not know that friendship with the world is is enmity with God. You, when you align with the world ahead of lining with God, you are literally moving sides on the battlefield to the enemy's side. You're fighting against God when you make yourself a friend of this world. Whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. That is a bold statement. Now, we would never think that. And it would break our hearts if in the moment of sin, we thought that thought. If in the moment when you're being tempted to, to lust and desire something, whether it be something sensual or something possession or, or some type of hobby or some type of relationship, no matter what it is, if in the moment you thought, what I'm doing right now by lusting after that is I'm abandoning God's side and I'm going over to align myself with God's enemies, you would stop in that moment, I would hope, and you would realize the gravity of your decision. We should all do that. 
to, to walk with the world's methods and the world's goals and the world's purposes rather than to walk in agreement with God is to make ourselves the friend of the world. It literally means alignment or agreement. Amos 3.3 tells us, can two walk together except they be agreed? The answer is no. You can only be friends with people that you agree with. And in this case here, it's either agreement with the world or it's agreement with God and you can't, you can't play both sides. You can't be a double-minded person. You, you choose. And some of us seem to fluctuate back and forth. Today I'm going to choose to live with God and be on His side. And today I'm just I'm having a rough day and so I'm going to pursue my own passions. Where does all that come from? Pride. Now this is extremely strong language. But it's direct, and that's what we want, isn't it? Sometimes we want direct statements. Now, usually we don't want direct statements when it's about our sin. We want direct statements about what we should do in a positive way for the Lord. But if we're not going to get our hearts right, we're not going to make those positive choices. And so James is pulling no punches here. He's not beating around the bush. He's getting directly to the point. And so many Christians are just far too friendly with the ways of the world than they are with the ways of God. I'm not saying we have to be Amish or something, ostracize ourselves and be odd people. But we should love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, and mind first. And our allegiance should be clear. We shouldn't leave doubt in other people's minds and certainly not in our own as to whose side we're going to be on. And so I ask you, how are you tempted to use the ways of the world rather than the ways of Christ? And we think of that in a high-level sense of like business, ethics, and morality, but it even goes down to the basic decisions that we make every day in our life of how we're going to serve the Lord. Are we going to do it in our methodology, in the ways that, that are most pleasing to us, or are we going to do it in the ways of the Lord? How, how are you tempted to lust for what the world offers rather than to, uh, to pursue the things that God? And so this is a very intense language. It should kind of stir up our hearts. It should stir our hearts so that there's this battle that we recognize. Because whether you recognize it or not, there is a battle going on. And so then he gets to the cure. I don't, we're not gonna, I don't want to leave you in the pride section here. Let's get to the cure, because the cure is what most of this is about. In fact, verse 5, he switches his language to the cure. How we can have the correct cure for our pride and for our, our, our own lusts and desires. And so verse 5, he, he asks a question. It's kind of a rhetorical question. Do you think that the scripture says in vain? In other words... Is this verse that I'm about to quote to you, is this a useless verse? Is this an empty verse? Or is there meaning in it? And of course, we know there's meaning. So here's the quote. The spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy. Now, why? Why after four verses of, of intense discussion of lust and pride, does he, does he just say, don't you know the Holy Spirit yearns with jealousy? What does that have to do with our passions and our heart? Well, the cure for pride, I believe, begins with knowledge of the holy. Verse 5 is a statement about God and His character. And if you want to fix the pride that's in your heart, if you want to, to solve the battle that's raging inside of you every day, to lust for your own things, to pursue your own passions, you have to get an accurate picture of God. You need to know what God is, who God is, what God expects, how God acts. And he begins with this verse that almost seems out of place to us. The spirit who dwells in us, so again, we're talking to believers, yearns jealously. God is a jealous God, and you should know that. God is jealous. He is not a passive God who tolerates being cheated upon. 
Listen, if you had a close friend or a relative who was cheating, cheated upon by their spouse, would you not probably side or empathize with them in, in some anger? In some desire for vengeance? In, in some retribution? In a desire for punishment? Because the person that you care about has been hurted and mistreated. We would. We would desire justice for that person now it doesn't matter what you think that justice looks like we would desire it we wouldn't want a person that we love and care about deeply to be hurt in such a a, a, a useless way a painful way and so we would be frustrated with them we would be angry with them we would well we would be jealous with them and this is what God feels. I'm not saying we can change God or we make God feel a certain way, but God, according to his character, is who he is. He does not change. He is the perfection of every attribute. And as a perfect, holy, and righteous God, when he is mistreated because of our sinfulness, he desires vengeance. He deserves vengeance. He is jealous, though, in this case, he's jealous for you and he's jealous for me. This is, this is God in, in his passion and in his affection for us, desiring what is best. So God is not passive. He doesn't just sit on the sidelines, kind of watching the world go, think, shaking his head once in a while, saying, oh, oh, there they go again. There goes mankind Boy, making those mistakes. They don't understand what I did for them. Oh, shame on them, shame on them. No, he is deeply pained by the infidelity of our soul. And he's jealous for us. Why? Because every good gift comes from God. James 1.17 Every good thing that you and I have, and George even mentioned that this morning, every good thing that we have comes from God. And what do we do when he gives us these good gifts? We throw it back in his face saying it's not good enough for me. I want something better. That's the adultery of our heart. We pursue it fiercely with passion. The things that oppose God. Let me, be, let me be plain and simple like James is. How do we do this? We lust for stuff. We lust for possessions, for cars, for boats, for houses, for, for technological devices. We lust for these things. We desire them. We think more about them at times than we think about God. We work harder to obtain them than we work hard to obtain righteousness for God. And thus in doing that, we are adulterers and adulteresses against the Lord. We lust for for passionate things. We, listen, there is no doubt in our community who the God of Westfield is. It is sports. Well, and the money you get from sports. This community loves sports and the money we get from sports. And yet we can desire that as well in our hearts. I love softball. Tomorrow night we have concessions. And we're going to have a good time playing softball, but, but that softball game that matters tomorrow night won't matter a, a year from now. And in fact, it probably won't matter a week from now. And at least for most of us, it won't matter at the tournament either. <laughs> but we can sure lust after things like that. Hunting, basketball, golf, whatever. Some of you might not lust for golf. <laughs> Anything that I place ahead of God, I commit adultery against him with it. That's the point. And in these moments, we've forgotten who God is. We've forgotten that he alone is worthy of our highest pursuits, our highest passions. He is the sovereign Lord. He is the giver of life. He is the source of what is good. He is the one who gives us grace and mercy and love. And notice what else. He yearns je jealously. 
He yearns jealous. To, to yearn uh, here is his perfect wording. The spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy. Yearns means a deep love and concern. Let me put it in, in more modern terminology that you and I would use. He desires the best for us. And, and I think the greatest example I could give would be of a, a parent and a child. And if you haven't experienced this and you have children, you will experience this. Or maybe you were the source of this. When as a parent, you look at your child and you know what is best for them, and yet they pursue something that is inferior. Now this makes me think of the prodigal son who, who leaves his father's household and he goes and lives riotously and, and then finally he comes back. The whole time the father is yearning and desiring that his son would make the right choice. That he would desire the things that are good. And boy, as a parent, when you want your child to pursue something and you don't force them, but their choice is up to them and they don't make the right choice. Your heart aches for them. And you desperately want to take them and force them to make the right decision. But you know you can't. That's the yearning jealousy that God has for us. He looks at us and it hurts his soul in a sense. Now God is perfect and we, we do not affect God in that we do not make him lesser or greater. He is already as great as he can be. He is perfect and yet at the same time we hurt his heart, if I can use that language, when we choose inferior things. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit is close you know, it doesn't just say God here. It says the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously. And so the spirit is close and he's working to turn our hearts back to him to protect and to guide and to nurture our holiness. And that's why he says in verse 6, but he gives more grace. And here's the idea. Christ has already given you grace. He's given you enough grace for salvation, not just for this life, but for all of eternity. And what do you do? You take that grace and you say, thanks for the grace. I really needed that. But right now, in the moment, I'm going to leave your side and I'm going to go over and I'm going to pursue the things that I want to pursue. And yet in that moment, God yearns with jealousy and he's ready and he has more grace to give you. So that when you come back, as you should, he has more grace for you. He gives more grace. Why? And we have this, this bold, plain statement. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And it doesn't conclude there. It obviously goes into verse 7, but that's why it's so important. God gives grace to the humble. God will not, God cannot give grace to the arrogant and prideful. Now, I did not make a mistake there. I meant to say that. God cannot. You know, you, you have all these silly questions. Can God make a rock too big? Blah, blah, blah. All those. I'll tell you something God cannot do. God, because of his infinite perfection and character, cannot give grace to arrogant people prideful people because they do not deserve it and he is holy and he must always be holy and your pride and your arrogance flies in the face of God's holiness it is unrighteousness and he cannot and will not be near it but if you humble yourself before God if you drop figuratively to your knees before God and you humble yourself and admit your need and admit your failure God gives grace He's got grace upon grace upon grace. Unending grace for you. That's what he means. And so that's where James arrives. And he, he makes that statement. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Well, how? Then the natural question is, how do I humble myself before the Lord. How do I receive his grace in humility? The answer for a believer, again, this is written to believers, is there in verse 7 to 10. 10 imperative statements. You want to humble yourself? You need to humble yourself. You want to humble yourself? Here's what you do. 10 statements. 
of humility. And we're going to look at those next week. But please understand, we have to understand the premise. Why? Why do I have to humble myself before the Lord? Because in our, our pride, we lust for ourself. We are unworthy of God. We have erred. I have erred. You have erred. We have lusted and warred against God. We have filled our life with adulterous choices. We have been unfaithful to God. But God is near. In fact, that's why we're commanded in verse 8 to draw near to him. Because he is near. And he is ready to give grace if we humble ourselves before him. And so I ask you, do you agree with God? Either you agree with God or you don't. You either agree with God or you agree with yourself, which is to agree with the ways of the world. And so I feel like I need to ask, though, obviously this whole context, the whole chapter, the whole book of James is written to believers. But if you're here today and you are not a follower of Christ, you have never asked for redemption, you have never sought God, you have never humbled yourself before God and received salvation, then you have much to fear. Because God is not just a jealous God, God is an angry God and a righteous God. And this is the part of God that sometimes we don't want to talk about, but God in his vengeance and his anger and in his wrath has every right to punish everyone who is wicked and evil, and every one of us are wicked and evil. God in his holiness and righteousness cannot be near sin. Therefore, he must either, either provide redemption for sin or cast sin away from him. And if you have never received the redemption or the payment for your sins, then the bad news is God will cast you away. And so I urge you not to wait until it's too late. Listen to the words of Philippians 3, though. If you're a follower of Christ, if you're a disciple, listen to these words. Philippians 3, verse 17. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame. Does that not sound like the ways of the world that were just described in James? Who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Therefore, my beloved and longed-for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast, stand firm in the Lord. Very simple question. Do you agree with God? That's what matters. It doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what the people of this church say. Do you agree with God about your pride, about your sin, about your spiritual adultery? Then humble yourself before the Lord. When we come to gather together to give God praise, to sing, to, to pray, to open up his word, it should be in humility. And so let us offer to Christ our humble contrition, our love, our worship, but from a heart that's in agreement with him, not a heart that's pursuing its own ways. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for this passage that is clear. Lord, we want so many times, we just want you to tell us what to do. Lord, tell me what your will is and I'll do it. And yet here, in very plain words, you tell us exactly what to do. I pray you'd help us to come before you in holiness, not according to our works of righteousness, but according to your righteousness, your goodness. And Lord, may you be honored.
And may you be glorified by how we respond. We pray this in Christ's precious name. Amen.